creating a heritage mobile phone app. Um, it wasn't easy. Um, we did quite a lot of things wrong. So you kind of learn about the lessons um, that we learned um, when we were doing it. And hopefully that will make it easier for yourselves. Now here's the team that we worked with. But it's to start off with, the reason we went down this route was that in October 2016, I saw this article in the Courier. And it was by St Andrews University and telling you that you could get a town's history and it was right at hand by one or two swipes of your phone. And I thought, great, if they can do it, we can do it. So I phoned up the university, managed to get on to Dr Alan Miller, talked it through with them and we thought we would work together and try and do this. Um, we applied for lottery funding and we got lottery funding in July 2017. And that's the team we worked with. Alan Miller, Best Roads, and Ian Oliver, and my husband, who's in the audience somewhere, and also Green Nature. And they used to provide history walks in the area. So the idea is that if you're thinking of doing something yourself like this to record historical sites and put them on a mobile phone app, then this should make it easier for you to actually do. We hope. We started off by thinking, right, we've got three history walks that my husband and Green Meacher um, provided for people uh, during the summer, and we were going to add to that. We were going to do a children's walk on top of this. We had identified 50 sites of historical interest, and we were going to number them sequentially. Um, we were kind of going to say, right, um, walk up Cadger's Wines, turn to the left, once you get to Chapel Green, we'll tell you all about the pilgrims that arrived there. And after a while we realised this wasn't going to work. In fact, it would only work if you actually were there on the site with your mobile phone. And our original idea was to create a kind of virtual tour of Ely and elsewhere. So somebody in America, Australia or wherever in Europe could actually link into any of these sites and do walks, but do it in any order they wanted. So we threw that idea out and we went back to the drawing board and we decided to create locations instead of sites and the university then said, well, okay, that's fine, but you can probably do sublocations as well with a maximum of up to 60 sublocations. But they said to us, you've got far too many sites and we can't manage that number, we have 22, so could you reduce it down? So we tried and tried, and we eventually got it down to 13, but about 10 to 12 is the ideal number. But they did allow us to have supplications as well. And here's an example of what is kind of a, a defined location on a specific site. It's Chapel Bean, where the pilgrims, having sailed over from North Berwick to Ellsbury, rested overnight before they then walked to St Andrews. Here's one of a street which we had as a, a location and I think, I don't know if this is 1960s or earlier, uh, probably the car probably tells us what the era is. And here's one of a wider area, this is King Craig Point, where there were um, defensive structures put there during the war. The university then said we had to collect GPS codes. <clears throat> we hadn't really thought about that. So they needed that because they were going to put teardrop icons on the map that we decided upon so we could actually press on the teardrop and get access to each of these locations and the information there. Now here's our map that we actually used. Now, when I retired, I took up painting. So I actually painted a map of Ely and Elsbury, so we didn't have to worry about copyright for it. And we placed the icons on it. And we actually have 13 because there's one off to the side as well. And on the mobile phone, if you press on these icons, that will take you right into that particular location. Now here's the map that Cranham produced, and that has 14 uh, GPS codes on it. Uh, sorry, icons, teardrop icons. And here's St Andrew's one with 22. Now 
Uh, we also had to think about um, the background colour, which had to be consistent throughout, and not just in the background of our photographs or um, any text, but also the labels, and it had to be consistent throughout. And um, we chose the background colours of the, the sand and the sea and the sky, because we were based at Ely and Elsbury. The University of St Andrews chose a kind of parchment colour, which fitted in with their mobile phone app, which was covering the kind of medieval era. They suggested to us that we should collect as much information as we could about each of the sites, because we could edit it later, or we could archive it. Um, we could collect as much and many videos as we liked, but we had to reduce them down to about two to three minutes <coughs> to be able to get them onto the phone. The thing that we didn't realise that was important um, was actually filing it by location. Um, my husband had information all over the place, massive, masses of files, and he did all the ground which was fabulous. But it was difficult to find that and access it again when you suddenly thought, hmm, that picture would go here. How did you find that? So it's so important to actually do that. You have to also identify uh, the buttons on the bars, because there'll be bars as either headers or and they take you into the accompanying website or into your videos or help you move around the mobile phone app. Fortunately, the university told us about carousels, so we were able to put up to six pictures on each carousel which swing around the top of your text and then you have the text underneath which matches it. But you have to make sure your labels on your photographs also match subheads on your text in terms of colour, in terms of size, uh, font size, and uh, font type. And a good idea is to use postcards because they'll tell you about the heritage of the area and you have fewer cars on there on the, the, rather than on ordinary pictures so they don't kind of obstruct the view. Here's uh, my map again with uh, the bar at the top that helps you navigate around, uh, around the mobile phone app. We then had to think about refining the text. We had oodles of text, far too much. And we had to cut it down to about 60 words per subheading and in each supplication. And again, we, you could have songs, you could have videos, you have to link them again to the bar. And we actually produced, well, the university did, a digital reconstruction of the chapel to be able to add to the mobile phone now. Here's one of King Creek Point, which has actually five sublocations below it. And you can see the buttons at the top, and you can swing that around. The buttons are to the photographs. Uh, here's one of Lynch Road, which has six sublocations sitting below that. And you have all the text, and as you go down the text, you get a subheading which will link to the picture above. Now, here's a, the Weavers song. There were a number of Weavers in Ellsbury in the 1800s, and uh, they had quite a tough life. And there was Sometimes they were linked to Dundee as well because um, they were very heavy into weaving as well. And here's their song, which I hope we'll be able to do, which will tell you about. <laughs> Well done.
we'll try go on to the next one. This is an introductory video that you get from that. Ely and Ellsbury History Society invite you on a journey through time in the borough of Ely and the Royal Borough of Ellsbury on the coast of Fife. Starting in the 10th century, with a huge influx of pilgrims arriving in Ellsbury from North Berwick by sea on the way to St Andrews to visit the relics and worship at the Shrine of the Apostle, through the lean years of the 17th and 18th centuries, until the arrival of the railway line and tourism in 1863. The app also covers the Mars boys from Wormit, who used to holiday here and entertain the residents. The thriving Ellsbury weaving and coal mining trades in the 19th century and the world-renowned golf club makers of the 20th century. And then it brings it right up to date with the villages as the holiday and recreation mecca that they are now. Click on the teardrop on the map at the site you wish to visit, and most importantly, we hope you enjoy the experience. And one final one, the digital reconstruction of the chapel, where you get to meet the pilgrims from the 16th century, uh, 1430s. At Chapel Green, the ruin is a 19th century reconstruction chapel or hostel which was built here in the 11th century to accommodate pilgrims travelling across the Forth from North Berwick by ferry. There was a similar establishment on the North Berwick side of the Firth of Forth and records show that in 1415, 15,000 pilgrims used this ferry route to St Andrews to worship the monks of the Apostle. This is believed to be what the chapel would have looked like. The pilgrims, after their sea journey across the port from North Bay, would walk up to the chapel to be generously received by the nuns who ran this establishment. They would pray for their successful deliverance from the ravages of the birth of Forth and would prepare for their onward journey to St. Andrew. We think that we would have left this chapel or hostel and walked over the hill. Right, very quickly, this time is running out. Um, the lessons we learned were spend a lot of time at the beginning to get things right in terms of the amount of text uh, for each of your locations and sublocations, your style of your photographs and your images, um, your font size, type, figures, etc. And also, the colour palettes and the quality of your audio output, that was one of the hardest things that we actually found. And eventually I think we used what's called one.